Good evening, friends. Um, I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation. I'm so glad that you are all here with us this evening to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Chaim Gross's arrival in New York City, along with Jewish Heritage Month. Um, just a quick bit about Village Preservation. As usual, we have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, the art, the history, the depth, and the value of preservation in our communities. We are a nonprofit membership-based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our website, and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org. So just a bit of Zoom protocol. Please feel free as you have been doing to use the chat to say hi, tell us where you're joining from, or to raise any issues or thoughts. If you have questions specifically for our speaker, please use the Q&A function. It just helps me to keep track of your questions. Um, you can submit those at any point during the talk and we'll get to as many as possible. So without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Sasha Davis. Sasha is the executive director of the Rini and Chaim Gross Foundation, which operates out of the Gross's incredible home at 526 LaGuardia Place. The foundation acquires, displays, researches, and educates about art, holding a very impressive and beautiful collection of over 12,000 items, including Gross's extensive personal collection. Prior to serving as director of the foundation, Sasha was its curator of collections for over three years. She holds a BA in art history and a certificate in arts administration from New York University. Sasha, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, Ariel, thank you so much for the invitation. It's such a pleasure. And I would like to say how thrilled I am um, to share the life of Heim Gross with you tonight. Um, also, thank you to Andrew Berman and the whole Village Preservation community. Um, you know, we've had a wonderful connection um, going back quite a few years now. Yes, yes, I meant to say the Growth Foundation won a Village Award in 2015, which actually our Village Awards are coming up in, in mid-June. So I'm going to put that link in the chat. All right, I'm going to go off video now. Thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can start uh, kind of showing you all the wonderful images um, that we're gonna be looking through tonight. Uh, so um, it's an honor to be with you and it's especially an honor to be here during Jewish Heritage Month. Um, this is a really important year in the legacy of Heim Gross. As Ariel mentioned, it's the centennial of his immigration to the United States. Um, it is also 30 years since uh, he passed. Uh, so he still has a big um, footprint and an impact on a lot of people's lives. Um, I hope that this talk is an invitation um, for you to visit us. Uh, we're planning to reopen for tours in the fall and we also have online virtual programming. So, you know, if you want to get on that, just uh, please follow us on our website. Uh, so this is the foundation's uh, facade. Uh, we preserve and interpret the historic home, studio, and art collections of the Grosses. Our mission is to further Heim Gross's legacy through high quality research, exhibitions, and educational activities. Uh, we are located in the South Village Historic District. Uh, we're on LaGuardia Place between Bleecker and uh, West Third. Um, some of you may have visited this um, space before, perhaps you've walked by at one point. Um, the building was originally built in 1873. Um, it was designed by Joseph M. Dunn and was a storefront on the ground floor and then lofts above. Uh, it had many um, original details and, and most of which were retained on the facade, including the cast iron, which you see is painted yellow in this photo by Elizabeth Felicella. 
So it was industrial use for many, many years. Um, but when the Grosses bought it in 1962, they completely renovated it. So on the foundation's ground floor, uh, we have this double height studio space that houses finished works, works in progress, tools and materials um, that was used for 20 years. And the space was not only a workspace, but also was frequently photographed. It was also the site for interviews um, and films. So I wanna start with a little bit of biography um, about Heim Gross so that you can better understand his uh, really incredible uh, life story. Uh, he went from refugee and immigrant uh, to a renowned sculptor, educator, collector, and philanthropist. He was born in 1902 um, in a small town called Velova in the Carpathian Mountains. Um, that particular area is known as Galicia, and it was part of Austria-Hungary at the time. It has uh, had the border shift over it numerous times um, throughout the last century, and it's now in Ukraine. He was born into a Jewish family, and his father was a timber appraiser. This will become important later in his life when he turned to wood carving as his primary medium. Uh, this photo was taken in Budapest in uh, 1919 and shows uh, three of the brothers. Um, on the left, we have Pincus in the middle, Abraham and Chaim on the right. Uh, he had an additional brother, Naftoli, and a sister, Sarah, who are not um, in this photo. And all of these photos that I'm showing are part of the foundation's um, extensive photo archive. Um, unfortunately, the family was uh, uprooted completely by World War I. Um, and Gross actually had a lot of very traumatizing experiences, um, including being pressed into service as a young teen burying bodies. Um, he survived all of that and um, made his way to Budapest to study art and goldsmithing. Uh, however, his life was uprooted yet again um, when the Jewish people were ex um, ex expelled from uh, the, that part of Budapest. Um, so he re relocated to Vienna, um, studying under the artist Bela Utz. So here I'm showing um, one of these early drawings. You can see when, when Gross was first learning, um, you know, how to be an artist, how to draw, how to capture what he was seeing. Uh, so this was done in 1920, and it shows the oldest Jewish cemetery in Kolomea, which is one of the larger towns um, his family had relocated to in Galicia. Um, shortly after, uh, Gross decided to immigrate to the United States. Um, he could see that there wasn't as much room for him to grow um, in Europe. And his brother Naftoli, who was a renowned poet, um, had already immigrated to the United States and um, encouraged him to do that. Uh, so once in the United States, um, Gross arrived in New York City. And in 1921, he almost immediately found himself at the Educational Alliance. Um, the G Educational Alliance uh, was a Jewish settlement house on the Lower East Side. Um, it had not only um, many settlement sort of services, but also this world-class art school that was headed by Abo Ostrowski. And um, the art classes were really integral because for an artist, um, young artist like Heim Gross, because they were um, free or nearly free. Um, he didn't have the money um, to pay for anything more than that. Um, and then in addition to um, being a student there, he also then went on to teach at the Alliance um, until the 1970s. So he understood that the institution had incredible value to the community. He uh, often referred to it as his home away from home. Uh, he also met his first friends um, within the first week of classes when he was at the Education Alliance. Um, in this case, Moses and Raphael Sawyer. Um, this photo that I'm showing here is from 1922 and it shows Moses on the left and Heim Gross on the right. Uh, the story that goes along with their meeting is that um, they were immediately friendly with one another, um, communicating in Yiddish, which was Gross's primary language. And um, Gross was very hungry, so Moses invited him back to his family's home for dinner that night. 
Um, and this friendship continued their entire lives. Um, and they all went on to have very successful careers as artists. Uh, you may have seen some paintings by the Sawyer brothers in uh, public collections, including the Whitney Museum of American Art. Um, a fellow uh, student at the Education Alliance was also the first one who remarked that Gross's drawings had a certain three-dimensional quality. That was a student by the name of Leo Jackinson. And that sort of spurred Gross to begin studying sculpture first at the Educational Alliance, um, and then later on in the mid 1920s um, with Ellie Nodelman at the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design and Robert Laurent at the Art Students League. Uh, Nodelman was really integral in teaching uh, Gross modeling, um, abstraction of form, and Laurent really taught him how to carve. So his first uh, wood pieces, which were done in relief, uh, are from 1926 and can be seen at the foundation. So this move towards uh, wood carving is very important for Gross's career. Um, he was actually part of a larger group of sculptors who worked in this method called the direct carving method. Um, it's very different from casting in bronze, uh, which was very popular in sort of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, direct carving is unique because it emphasizes spontaneity, it emphasizes the natural material, and they often use the phrase truth to materials, um, meaning that you are enhancing what is naturally in the piece of wood or in the piece of stone, if you're working in stone. Uh, so this method is subtractive. So you're starting with a block and then working inward. Um, it's very, very different from um, building up a form in clay where you're adding on pieces. Uh, so the sort of conceptual aspects of it are, are very different. And what's interesting about um, Gross's work is that he really popularized this method. Um, he was pulling from many different sources um, to make his own work. He was looking at uh, African arts, he was looking at folk art, he was looking at modern art um, from modern masters both in Europe and in the US. Um, his materials also were revolutionary. Uh, at the time, there were various lumber yards um, in New York City and especially in Manhattan, none of them really exist anymore, but they had these exotic hardwoods that were available for furniture makers. And Gross favored these types of woods uh, because they had beautiful grain, beautiful density. They took a high polish and, and didn't need a lot of alteration, just buffing with wax. Um, Gross didn't believe in, in painting the surface of his sculptures. Uh, so some of his favorite woods were ebony, mahogany, and lignum vitae, um, which is the densest of all woods. And you can actually see a piece of it in this photo. Um, it's hard to tell in the black and white photo, um, but this type of wood has a very characteristic dark chocolate brown heartwood, and then uh, these blonde streaks of sapwood around. Um, so you can have a lot of variations um, in color and it looks really um, eye-catching. So the sculpture is called Acrobats Balancing and the photo is by Elliot Ellisoffen and it was taken in 1938. And Ellisoffen is a well-known photographer, uh, worked for many years for Life Magazine and was a close personal friend of the Grosses. Uh, so Gross here is shown with a chisel in one hand or a gouge and then a mallet in his right hand. And you can see that that mallet is fairly small. So that would tell me that he has already roughed out the general form and he's now refining it and um, taking out very small pieces of wood at once. And this is um, part of the initial kind of steps in that you, you're starting with the block and then you're working inward, you're not um, filing or um, using sandpaper or anything like that. Um, so by 1927, uh, Gross had already established his own studio. So fairly early on in his career, um, it was a very small little Garrett studio on um, 14th street and um, he, worked there, but within a few years, he had quickly outgrown it. And uh, in 1930, he moved to a much larger space at 63 East 9th Street, um, right next to Broadway. 
Uh, so here's a photo I'm showing of Gross in the studio. He's sketching. Um, the significance of this location is that it was a central hub of artist studios in the village. Uh, he participated in this incredible uh, you know, social network of artists working in these new modern styles. It was a very lively atmosphere. You know, artists would pop in and out of one another's studios, they would exchange ideas and they would exchange works. Um, so you can see on the wall um, behind Gross on that brick wall, it's painted white, that we have all these works by other artists. And you see the beginning of Gross's collecting. Uh, so this is another Elliot Ellisoffen photo taken in 38. And just to point out, if you can see my cursor, we've got works by, by David Berliuk, Raphael Sawyer, another Raphael Sawyer here, Benjamin Cotman, Edgar Levy, John Graham, and John Marin here. So we see a wide variety of artists um, who Gross sort of interacted with um, in a personal way. And the 1930s were really crucial to Gross's life trajectory and setting him on the, the life course um, that he continued on. Um, it was very difficult um, due to the Great Depression. Um, however, he was, he was very busy, um, not only with work, but also in his personal life. Um, in 1929, he um, met Rini Nation, and in 32, they got married. Um, Rini was known for having a really sparkling and outgoing personality. Um, she was studying literature in college, and she had this determination um, to be with Heim Gross, um, you know, even though her parents were a little bit concerned about, you know, his financial status, but she really uh, saw what he was. Um, and so this photo of them very early on shows them in the 30s, um, I think even before they got married. And then um, they went on to have a lovely family, um, two children. Uh, so uh, Yehuda in 1935 and then Mimi in 1940. So on the right, this is an incredible photo taken by Arnold Newman uh, showing Rini Yudi and Mimi in 1943. Um, quite often you see the images of mothers and children in Gross's work. And um, he did often sketch from life, um, from personal experience. And Rini did serve as a muse um, for him, one of many roles that she served um, during her lifetime. So in 1932, Gross had his first solo show at Gallery 144. So once again, 1932 was a big, big year uh, for Gross. Um, this photo shows Gross posed um, at that exhibition with a work from the same year, so 1932. And this piece is called Lindbergh Family. It's carved in Golden Street, Eaglewood, and it depicts the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh Jr., uh, the toddler son of the famous pilot. This story had captured uh, the nation's news and Gross's response is, is quite simply a masterwork. Um, it conveys the story through abstracted images, including um, crawling baby at the top, um, which I'll point out right here. I'm a little farther down, we have the images of Charles Lindbergh and his wife with these sort of ovoid forms. Um, and then you can't see it in this, um, angle, but in the back there um, is an eagle tail, um, which references the pilot's nickname, which was the Lone Eagle. So the stacking of forms um, owes heavily to African arts, uh, which Gross had begun to um, collect a few years earlier, and he was studying very closely. So many of uh, Gross's most well-known works um, are more universal in theme, um, and they're, they're not about contemporary or current events as this piece was. Uh, so for example, um, he was sketching, sketching from life quite often, um, and uh, he did often depict sort of the groups of mothers and children, as I mentioned before, um, but he was also heavily inspired by female figures, dancers, and acrobats. Um, he also drew inspiration from um, 
the circus, Yiddish theater, vaudeville, and the streets of New York. <laughs> so um, here I'm showing uh, a sketch of acrobats on the left. So that's a 33, 1933 drawing um, that eventually became a sculpture called Acrobatic Performers, which can be seen at the Smithsonian American uh, Museum in DC. Um, and on the right, we have this lovely watercolor uh, from 1932, and this is a Washington Square Park. And there are quite a few different parks um, represented within um, the drawings that we have in the collection. So moving on from sort of the 2D to the 3D, um, I wanna show this photo by Arnold Newman, um, this really iconic portrait of Gross. Um, he's posed in what seems a little bit casual, but it's still very, very posed, it's very scripted. Um, and this is one of those really iconic early works by Gross, it's called Happy Mother, and was done in 1931. Um, it, it is in the Foundation's collection, and what's remarkable about it. It has a few aspects that are quite remarkable. One of which is um, the texture of the surface um, in that he left the chisel marks, uh, clearly showing the hand of the artist, which was very important to him. Uh, another aspect that's quite interesting is that quite often Gross's works were long and narrow, um, sort of reflecting a tree trunk using you know, the materials he had. But in this case, he's taken that columnar shape and flipped it to be horizontal. Um, and it has that narrow little base here, which is you know, part of the same piece of wood. And it's just an incredibly balanced composition. And then also just in terms of physics to, to balance that weight of the mother and the child and the legs on the other end. Um, very, very difficult to do. So the physicality of Gross's working methods um, also became an inspiration to other artists. He only used hand tools. He did not um, use electric tools. Um, and his large finished sculptures can weigh hundreds of pounds. Um, so when you think about that, the amount of physical effort it would take to do that work and, and how um, much material would have to be removed. Um, and so sometimes he did use uh, saws to do his work. Um, he also did not like to use studio assistants. He wanted to do things um, on his own. Uh, so I'm showing two images, um, two oil on canvas portraits from uh, the collection, both are by close friends of Gross. Uh, so on the left, we see a 1944 portrait by Milton Avery, which shows Gross using a rasp to smooth the surface of the wood. So that would be done after the chiseling process. Um, and then on the right, we have a portrait from 1929. So fairly early on. Um, so when Gross was in that small 14th Street studio and that's painted by Raphael Sawyer. So this fascination was, you know, with painters watching Gross work, trying to sort of capture that movement. Um, but this also translated to uh, other media like photography and film. So in 1938, uh, director Louis Jacobs, uh, working with the cameraman Leo Lancis, uh, filmed Gross at work on a portrait of Rini. Uh, so the film is titled Tree Trunk to Head. You can see the title on the left um, and then a still on the right. Um, it was shot on 16 millimeter uh, film. It's silent in black and white. And it just shows you the process um, of direct carving from first sketches to the final product. Um, it also has um, elements of comedy and um, also has a lot of really dramatic shots of different works that Gross had in his studio at the time. Um, it's available to watch on the Foundation's website. It's 28 minutes. Uh, so I, I highly recommend watching it if you can. And Gross used it as an educational aid throughout his career. He found it very helpful in describing his work to use the film to show people exactly what it looked like to, to make a sculpture. So Gross also did several pro projects for the Public Works of Art Project, the PWAP, and also the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. 
Um, I won't name all of them, but I will share uh, two that were both done for the 1940 uh, World's Fair, um, both of which um, are really incredible stories, but also very, very different. Um, so the first one, um, showing uh, some photos by Elliot Ellisoffen, um, showing Gross working on this incredibly large monumental sculpture called Harvest. So it's depicting a family um, and it was set up in the fair outdoors, um, but made in plaster. So these were not intended for long-term use and they were actually destroyed after um, the fair's closure. And you can see the, the scale of um, the workers helping to assemble it on the left and then um, Heim Gross looking quite small over here on the right. Um, and actually I should mention, so the one on the left is early Ellisoffen and then the photo on the right is by Walter Russell who did photograph Gross um, several other times throughout his career. So the other project that Gross did for the World's Fair um, involved having Gross do a live carving demonstration over the period of four months. Um, so this, these two photos, um, we don't know the photographers, but they show Gross at very different points in the process. So on the left, he has taken his chalk and he's made a sketch onto the log and he's beginning to sort of chip away um, the very edges of, of the log. Um, and on the right, you see he's much further along. You actually have the figure quite formed at that point. It's really um, in the refining stages. Um, and the newspaper articles that we have in our archives are very fascinating because at the time, um, there was still a lot of uh, uncertainty about uh, sort of the abstraction of the body. And there was a lot of pushback from visitors. And sometimes they would heckle Gross as he was working, you know, sort of commenting on the woman's proportions and, and um, just thinking it was very exaggerated, um, which of course Gross sort of played into and he had all sorts of witty comebacks <laughs> for people's comments. Um, and this piece is now in the Brooklyn Museum's collection. It is on view, it is called Ballerina. So that's one that you can also um, view in person. Uh, so his interest in educating um, on direct carving um, extended beyond, you know, his participation in the film Tree Trunk to Head, but really culminated in this publication, which was the 1957 How To Manual, The Technique of Wood Sculpture. Um, and as it says on the cover, it is profusely illustrated with um, beautiful photos taken by Elliot Ellisoffen um, from 1938, showing that uh, sculpture acrobats uh, balancing in Lignum and Vitae. Uh, Gross not only explains, you know, each process in great detail, um, but he also went through the trouble of explaining all the tools um, that someone would need to do this work, and then also has this really uh, detailed appendix about the different types of wood that were available on the market at the time. Um, unfortunately, many of these woods were very heavily or overforested, they're no longer available. Um, but it's very interesting to read, um, you know, what was available and also to understand a little bit more about these woods qualities. Um, he really, really knew um, the different types that were available and, you know, what their best uses were. So the 50s were very much a transitional time for Gross. He did publish the book, um, but he was also moving studios um, multiple times. Um, the first time um, was then when he left the Knight Street studio in 1953. Um, that building was torn down. Um, and then he moved to 12th Street, um, had an issue there, had to move. Um, and then moved to Horatio Street, uh, 48 Horatio Street um, in 1956. So that's where this photo was taken. Um, and, you know, he was happy to work there, um, but he didn't last too long in that studio either uh, because the, the rent really was, was too high. Um, and it didn't really make sense for him to, at this stage in his life, to continue renting um, a studio space. Um, throughout this entire time that he had a studio in the village, um, the family lived on the Upper West Side on 105th Street. 
and Gross would travel down to the village every day to work, uh, oftentimes taking his bike. Um, but he was at the point in his life, he was hoping to not have to travel or commute quite so far. Um, so they were in a good place financially to start looking for um, a place to buy. And in this case, they wanted to buy a building. Um, so this was in the early 1960s and they wanted a building that could serve as both home and studio. So they found it in 1962 in the form of five to six West Broadway, which we now know as LaGuardia Place. And um, it was a four story brick building, as I mentioned before, that it was built in 1873. Uh, when they purchased it, um, it was being used as an art moving um, and storage facility called Berkeley Express, which was um, how they were aware of it being up for sale. Uh, it was industrial and required significant um, alterations, spec especially in the interiors um, to make it suitable for what they wanted. Um, so they worked with two architects by the name of Arthur Malson and Don Ryman on the renovations. So Malson and Ryman assisted Gross um, in placing the stairs and placing the elevator. Um, the changes to the facade, which included um, adding uh, purple brick, uh, but keeping a lot of the cast iron details. Um, they also designed the plans for this incredibly dramatic 25 foot wide skylight, which illuminates the sunken studio um, and also illuminates the uh, finished works in the gallery next door. So this is a photo that was taken um, in, in 2018 by Elizabeth Felicella, and it shows the space after undergoing a complete restoration. Um, there were various uh, points of entry where water was getting in, in the skylight. Um, so now it really looks as it did uh, when the grosses uh, first renovated the space. So in addition to having um, this incredible collection of uh, grosses works, uh, the foundation also has an incredible collection um, of other artists work. And Reenie and Hayam had so much art that they installed it everywhere, including throughout the building, looping up the powder coated industrial style stairs all the way into their living room, dining room and kitchen on the third floor. So this is another Elizabeth Felicella photo, um, which really demonstrates uh, how much art you can see um, in the space and also the variety of works. You know, we see portraits um, done by Moses Sawyer of Rini and Hayam, um, abstractions. Um, there's also a little, well, it's not that little, but a, a beautiful Stuart Davis um, still life right here that's very early, um, quite, a, quite a variety. And when you go up the stairs um, after pausing a few times to look at things, you would end up on the foundation's third floor, which is the historic living room, dining room, and kitchen. Um, so the, this photo and the next one I'm gonna show you um, are by unknown photographers, and they show the south and north walls of the living room. Um, the bedrooms were on the fourth floor, and the second floor was rented out as an apartment when they lived there, so now we use that space um, for exhibitions. Uh, Gross used this space in a sort of fluid way in that he would quite often tinker with the installation of the works on the walls. Um, so this is called a salon style hang. So instead of um, putting all of the paintings sort of in a linear row, you have things stacked and there's a conversation between the works happening not only horizontally, but vertically, diagonally. Um, and especially in this photo here, um, this one to a certain extent as well, but you see this wonderful um, movement and line sort of wavering throughout the wall, um, which keeps your eye moving. Um, and that's something that um, at the foundation we've tried to retain, um, even if works have to be moved due to conservation reasons or loans, we always try to hearken back to that um, same sort of aesthetic. Um, and this, 
the selection here is um, a wonderful way of looking into sort of the early 20th century in American art. Um, so just to name some of the people that you're seeing on the walls, we have Raphael Sawyer, Andre de Rohn, Marston Hartley, Jose Clemente Orozco, Abraham Walkowitz, Federico Castillon, Milton Avery, Max Weber, Roberto Mata, Joseph Stella, Philip Evergood, Willem de Kooning, Jacob Lawrence, and Arshel Gorky. Uh, so wonderful um, selection of, of artists here, shown here. Um, the rugs and furniture are also in situ in the historic space. Um, these rooms um, were for domestic use, um, but they're also very large and open. Um, you know, these, these spaces had sometimes been used for industrial use, like um, a hat factory. So the rooms were fairly large and open. And that's something that the grosses uh, retained. Um, and you have Victorian furniture um, mixed with this 1960s um, style cove molding and lighting, um, which is once again, is this wonderful interplay of the past and sort of contemporary together. Um, the grosses also had a lot of people over, even though this was their private space, um, Rini was a great entertainer. And it was also quite um, a popular spot, especially in the 70s and the 80s, um, for visits uh, during the Soho Gallery openings. So a lot of times, you know, people would pop in before going to the galleries and then they would come back to discuss what they had seen. And this wasn't just artists who were attending these salons. It was also uh, writers, actors, musicians, intellectuals of various kinds. It was um, both private and sort of public in a certain way. So here's a photo of the third floor living room today, um, showing that little has changed in terms of the installation. Uh, we see in this photo works by John Graham, Rachel Marsh, Mimi Gross, uh, Jaime and Rini's daughter, uh, Red Grooms, uh, Milton Avery, Jose Clemente Orozco, Louise Nevelson, who was a student of Jaime's at the Educational Alliance. Um, we also see a uh, painting by Marston Hartley and John Metzen J. Uh, this, this is also helpful in that it shows a different angle of that lighting system that Gross developed, um, which was basically a series of incandescent bulbs to um, light the wall evenly. So integrated throughout this space, um, our work through, where we have so many works by American and European artists, which I've been focusing on, um, there are also many, many pieces from the African Arts Collection, which numbers over 2000 objects. And Gross began collecting African arts in the late 1920s, and it became his favorite thing to collect. Um, Part of this was because these pieces contained the very elements of sculpture that he most admired. Um, there's uh, the simplification and abstraction of the human body. Um, there's also this incredible um, detailed work when carving wood. Um, and quite honestly, you know, I think he recognized a lot of his own style um, in this work. There was a little bit of discussion over, you know, who influenced who. Um, Gross was very cagey about talking about his influences, but I think we can, we can definitely see a connection whether it was um, subconscious or not. Uh, so this collection is largely from Western and Central Africa. Uh, there are notable pieces from the Ashanti, including the Ashanti um, gold bait collection, which are brass weights. Um, there's also uh, pieces from the Banmana, the Dan, Dogon, Kota, Mambila, Senefo and Yoruba. Uh, he did collect primarily in New York City, um, but he also collected pieces while he was traveling, including um, in Paris. So this is a 1965 photo. So shortly after they had moved into the space and it shows just a selection um, of, this, of this display and also some of his library below. So um, on the left, we see that case today. So the books have been removed from these shelves at the bottom, but you can see the quantity um, of, of how many pieces he collected and also the variety um, 
you know, there are certain areas that he liked to collect. For example, the Aruba pieces here. These are abeji, um, also called twin figures. Um, but generally, you see uh, quite a lot of variety in, in, in style um, and culture group. And then also on the right, I'm just showing you a selection or a tiny little piece of the dining room where you can see how the African arts pieces are integrated um, throughout the space with these uh, works by Henry Moore, um, Mimi Gross, um, and other European and American artists. So returning back to Gross's sculpture, um, I mentioned this very sort of significant period of transition that was happening to him in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, and it was not only in his location where he was working, but also um, his methods of working and his style. Uh, so he began traveling more often. Um, he went many times to Israel uh, and then also notably to Italy, where he went in 1957, 59, and 61. And that was specifically to develop his work in bronze. Uh, his original forays into bronze were um, to make copies essentially of his wood pieces. Um, but as he experimented with um, additive methods, um, working on plaster, uh, he discovered this whole new way of working, which was um, moving away from those solid condensed forms you have with direct carving and you have something that's open, light, and airy. Uh, so on the left, I'm showing an Arnold Newman photograph of gross modeling and plaster. Um, and this is for the work Bird's Nest. Uh, so he was working in Rome in 57 uh, in the rented studio of the uh, sculptor Pedicle Fazzini. And then on the right, you see that finished sculpture in cast in bronze um, as it was displayed last year um, in the foundation's second floor space. So I really firmly believe that the infusion of new ideas um, generated by travel, um, combined with the influx of artists from um, Europe um, into New York, sort of following World War II, um, spurred him to new creative ideas. Um, he was still working at Winstone, that did not end, um, but he really amplified his work um, in bronze. And he also worked a lot more in Provincetown when he summered there. So mentioning um, this movement of artists from Europe to the US um, after the Second World War, um, I would also like to call attention to um, Gross's uh, family life. Um, two of his brothers had immigrated to the US, so Abraham and Naftoli, um, but he did still have friends um, in Europe or uh, family members in Europe when Hitler uh, came into power. Uh, so unfortunately, um, he lost both his sister Sarah and her family and also uh, his brother Pincus, um, all of whom were murdered by the Nazis, um, which brought up a lot of those memories that Gross had of what he had seen during World War I. Um, and although in many cases he was showing this very public joyful work, um, he was also dealing with these very um, deep, painful issues. Um, and this particular work really evokes um, that pain. Um, this is uh, the sculpture in memoriam, my sister Sarah, victim of Nazi atrocities, which was carved in 1947 and gifted to the Smithsonian Institution's Hirschhorn Museum in 1974. Um, I'm always taken by this work. Um, it's, you know, so similar to a lot of his works, but the, the effect is very different. Um, a lot of times his works have a very strong upward lift, but this one is contracting. You can see um, his depiction of his sister Sarah essentially sort of bent over um, protecting her child. Um, this period of reflection um, on these events also profoundly connected him back to those Jewish roots. Um, he was always connected to a world of Jewish artists um, within his network. Um, and he always had a sustained cultural connection, um, but now he in included more biblical themes in his work. Um, he also took on uh, several 
very difficult and monumental um, commissions, um, including here um, a series of six bronze panels showing the six days of creation. Um, and these are installed at Temple Sheree Tefila on Manhattan's Upper East Side, which is at 79th Street and 2nd Avenue. Um, and this is a 1964 uh, photo um, by Bud Studio showing him working on the first day. And these are bronze, they are nine feet high and they are also gilded. So they're quite um, striking when seen um, in person. So these were incredible projects, um, but his most revolutionary work in bronze um, was not the result of working in clay as he was working um, in clay with the um, panels, um, but instead it was working in plaster. And this is, a photo um, showing him draping um, muslin or um, other cloth onto a metal armature. It's been soaked in plaster. And in 1972, he published a second book. This was called Sculpture in Progress. And um, it includes photos by Peter Robinson and describes this method of working. Um, I'm showing another photo here. Um, this is by Lenore Soroka from 1979, showing gross at work um, on a plaster that many of you may be familiar with. Um, it's known as the family. And this monumental bronze uh, was gifted to the city in honor of Mayor Ed Koch in 1991. Um, unfortunately, it was just after Gross's passing, although he had intended to gift um, this piece um, while he was still alive. Uh, so this is a photo of Gross working. You can see he's a little bit blurry. He's in motion. He's um, finished really the um, figures of the mother and father, and now he's working on um, the children that are held aloft. Uh, so here on the left, I'm showing uh, a photo of Rini with the newly ins uh, installed sculpture. Um, this photo is by Richard Allen Fox. And um, the photo on the right documents the official unveiling um, with um, Mayor Koch speaking um, and the sculpture behind him. Um, so this is at Bleecker Street Playground. It's at the corner of West 11th Street. If you've ever walked by that corner, um, it, it dominates um, sort of the vision and it, it has had a home there now for, for uh, 30 years. So Gross also utilized the entrance of 526 LaGuardia Place as another uh, sort of gallery space to show his finished pieces. Um, so this is going a little bit back in time. These photos are from 1965, um, taken by Marvin Belotsky, but they show Gross placing this bronze called uh, Birds of Peace um, in front of the building. Um, although this spot is now um, the site of a different uh, bronze sculpture by Gross, um, you can see that it is advertising what you will find inside, but it's also a little mysterious because there's the gate in front of it. Um, it also adds interest to that particular block. Um, you know, seeing the facade today, a little has changed, um, especially in the photo um, on the left. Um, there is the addition of the bronze plaque that was placed by Village Preservation and the Two Boots Foundation um, in 2015. But other than that, it looks um, as it did at that period of time. So Gross um, continued to work in all these different media throughout his career, um, but there was a resurgence of wood in the 1980s. So he was heavily influenced by the walks that he took around LaGuardia Place, including uh, south into Soho. Uh, he did have another second studio on Grand Street, which uh, was a much messier studio. And that photo that I showed by Lenore Soroka of him working on the family was actually shot um, in that studio. So um, he saw these women in mini skirts and he was reminded of a lot of the women that he was seeing in the 1920s that he drew inspiration from. Um, so I'm doing a comparison here um, from, from 1928 and 1983. So a, a world of time had passed, but he's, he's still looking at the same forms and the same um, inspirations. So on the left is East Side Girl, which is from 1928. It's carved in lignum vitae. And it was gifted uh, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art by Mimi Gross in the early 1980s. 
um, it's now on view. So you can go ahead and, and visit her whenever you'd like. Um, and it's really a direct corollary with what you're seeing on the right, um, which is uh, this 1983 Soho Girl number one. Um, also carved in lignum vitae, which I mentioned before, has this wonderful variation in color um, quite often. Um, so they're the same material. Um, they're both women sort of turning to their left. They're both wearing these very fashionable clothes. Um, the woman on the left, um, Isard girl, she uh, has a little cloche hat. She has a little cape. Um, you know, she's absolutely, you know, a woman of the time. On the right, once again, that mini skirt, the little bow tie, the little hat. Um, you know, despite being 55 years apart, um, you can see this, this continuous theme. Um, despite varying the source, varying the neighborhood, um, he's always staying true to this vision um, that he kept to throughout his career. Um, and he always wanted to um, draw out that material. Um, so these, these pieces of wood are, you know, fairly blocky, once again, much different than the flexibility that you have in um, bronze casting. So Gross lived the almost entirety of the 20th century, um, 1902 to 1991. Um, his life was incredibly rich. Um, this is a photo by Susan Wiley showing him in his studio uh, fairly on in his life. This is around 1980. Um, he was very resolute in a lot of his commitments, for example, to work, to education, to his family. Um, you know, he had this incredible understanding of working in wood that he shared with thousands of students, um, including some who are very well known, including Lise Nevelson, who actually had not studied sculpture um, until she worked with, with him. Um, he taught at the Education Alliance, the New School for Social Research, the Art Students League and Brooklyn College. And um, the foundation's commitment to maintaining the collection um, and historic spaces is really important to the larger community of the village. Um, it brings alive a very rich and important moment um, in art history and the history of the neighborhood. Um, and a story that is very unique in that it really cannot be told with a larger museum. You have to be in that space where you're getting that close personal contact with an artist's working space, their materials, and also their collections. You really have the inside view to uh, what Gross was thinking about, what he was looking at. Um, you know, he kept very good records of the works he made and what he was purchasing, um, but quite often he didn't leave uh, information about his inspiration. So we have to look around um, the space and also look at his um, incredible library to understand a little bit more about his thought processes. Um, and finally, I'd like to share this photo, uh, which was taken by Allen Ginsberg. Um, and I just love this photo because you see this um, very personal engagement um, between Haim and Rini Gross as he's reaching up to kind of touch her hair and she's looking at the camera and sort of laughing. Um, you know, they they were both united on this idea of education and, you know, leaving a foundation that would really educate people about this period of American art. Um, and reading was really important um, throughout Haim's life as, you know, muse, mother, manager, model. <laughs> she did everything. Um, she also uh, organized the social calendar and, you know, he, she was the gregarious one. Uh, Haim tended to be quite quiet. Um, and she really worked tireless, tirelessly um, uh, to maintain the foundation up until her death um, in 2005. Uh, so once again, this, this photo I, I find very illustrative in terms of not only their relationship, but also um, better understanding of Gross's personal connections um, with others, including um, this very uh, significant friendship with Ginsburg even though they you know, were not in the same discipline, um, they, they connected. Um, and Ginsburg even wrote the tribute to Gross for the proceedings of the American Academy of Arts and Letters um, in December, 1991, so right after he had passed. Um, and I will just leave you with this last line um, in, the, in the tribute, which is, 
So now he's sitting drinking tea with old acquaintances, Mark Chagall and the Sawyer Boys in Heaven, or whatever shul their shades attend, which I think is a wonderful sort of encapsulation um, of that relationship and, and how Ginsburg saw Bruce's life. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to uh, reading and hearing your questions. Yes, Sasha, thank you so much. This, this just was so absolutely beautiful. Um, and I, I learned, I learned so much from you. I'm really grateful. Um, so anyone who's here, this is a great time to submit questions. We've got a couple and I also have a couple. Um, our questions come from Jeff. Um, oh, this actually you answered, which is great. Um, uh, he wanted to know, um, when you mentioned the Educational Alliance, is that something that still exists? Is that the Manny Cantor Center on East Broadway? It is. So the building has been completely um, altered. Um, but yes, that's exactly the same spot. So if you go there, you can be in that same location. Um, and they still provide very important um, resources. They have a gym, they have art classes. Um, I, I recommend if you're not familiar with them um, to look into their work. Oh, great. Um, he also wants to know in what studio was Harvest made? Ooh, that's a good question. I know it was not Gross's main studio. I believe it actually was in Brooklyn or Queens. Um, that's something I can maybe look up and get back to you. But he would not have had that kind of big, enormous um, industrial space um, to work in. Um, as you that can see, like, it was pretty hot. So it yes. <laughs> What, what was it made out of? Was it stone? It was plaster, which I find fascinating because, you know, plaster outdoors is a very short shelf life. Um, you know, it would be different if this was up for, you know, a few days, but it was up for months. Uh, so at the, you know, sort of the duration, it was on view, but at the end, there were uh, dozens of these enormous sculptures like this one that were simply, um, dismantled and just buried. <laughs> um, and because of, you know, water being underground, I mean, there, there's, there would be nothing left. Now, even if you were to do an archeological dig and see if you could find anything, you, you wouldn't be able to, um, maybe some armature, um, but you wouldn't be able to find the original sculptures. Wow, that's so incredible. It's a good thing we have photographs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, I was, I was curious about his sort of progression, which, which you mentioned from working primarily in wood to then adding plaster and other kinds of things. Was that related to the, the physicality of it and his aging? I know other sculptors have talked about sort of changing their mediums as their bodies changed as they got older. Was that a factor? He never said that. Um, and what's interesting is he did go back to working in wood towards the end. Um, however, all the pieces that he did in the last sort of decade of his life um, were all fairly small in scale. So I think at that point you can see um, he doesn't have the same physical strength. Um, he also, I know, occasionally did use some people to sort of assist him, not with chiseling, but sometimes like sawing. Um, mm. So for example, um, Mimi Gross remembers helping him to sort of cut out um, sort of the silhouette of a piece that was very flat. So it wasn't really a relief because it was worked on both sides, um, but she does recall um, that was one of his ways of getting around um, sort of the physical um, aspects of age. Um, but I would say that move in the 50s was not so much about um, how the sculpture was made, but about these evolving ideas that he had. The, you know, the not having a, a sort of a stable studio, the the travel going, you know, to Israel every year, going to, to Italy multiple times, um, he fundamentally changed the way he was thinking about his work. And he was uh, very excited at this, this new possibility um, of working in a very different kind of way, um, yet still evoking the same themes and subject matters that he'd been uh, accustomed to. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, more questions from me. Hold on, let me check the Q&A. 
Um, oh, Jeff is also wondering if um, he was influenced in his woodwork by Ellie Nadelman. I don't even know who that is. Oh, you, you have to look him up. I will. Uh, there was an incredible show um, at the New York Historical Society a few years ago that looked at Nonelman's um, folk art collection, I believe. Um, that, like, if you can get the catalog for that, that's incredible. Um, so Nonelman was one of Heimgross's teachers at the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design. So there's a very direct relationship there um, in terms of influence. Um, once again, Gross is very cagey about where he was taking sources from, but I, I think it's clear when you look at the work of both Nadelman and Laurent that those were very key in um, his development. Amazing, thanks. Yeah, so much to learn. Um, so um, I'm curious what, oh, thanks, thanks Jeff, yeah, for the context. Um, I'm, I'm so curious about the African art and every time I've come to the foundation, which all of you who are, who are here, you should absolutely go. It's just so, so, it's such a magical place. Um, it, I, you, it has something generative inside of the place that, that is um, such a, a space of creativity. Um, but I'm curious, did he ever speak about what drew him to African art? Did he go to Africa? What was the, I mean, I can, I can see very much the, the parallels um, and the influences in his work. I'm just curious about that. Great, great question. So once again, he was always um, sort of limited in terms of what he would call an inspiration. I think the only artist he ever said was an inspiration and it was documented was um, Constantine Brancusi. Um, but you can see the influence of the African art, especially in the, t the stacking of figures. So I showed um, uh, the Lindbergh family um, early on in the presentation that was done in 1932. And, um, you know, all these images that are quite abstract, but, you know, are still human bodies are kind of placed on top of one another. And, uh, you know, that would have been a direct reference to African arts. And he would have started collecting African arts in the late 20s. So this already would have been in his psyche. He would have been ruminating on the work. Um, what he talked about when he talked about the African sculpture um, was this um, incredible sort of detailed craftsmanship, how things were made, how things really kept to the column of wood that they were, you know, working with, which is something he also prioritized. Um, he also talked about the abstraction of the human body. Mm. And um, he didn't really talk about it too much, but there's a certain kind of, I think, sort of spiritual connection as well. Um, he didn't, he didn't write about this though, but it, it's something that you hear um, people who knew him personally um, mention. Mm. I appreciate that. Oh, and then another another thing you asked about the travel. Sorry, I missed that part. Um, oh, sure. He didn't he didn't go into Africa until the 1960s. Um, so there was decades where he was collecting African arts and hadn't been there. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1964, he went to uh, Ghana, and while he was there, he didn't collect any African arts, but he did do a lot of sketching. So the watercolors that he produced during that trip. Um, are really luminous and, and gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And most of those are in the um, archives of American art. Oh, they can be accessed by the great. public. <laughs> wow. I'm gonna write this down. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to find it, everybody. I like to put a bunch of links in our follow-up emails. So I'm gonna try to find it and, and send it along. Um, yeah, and I guess this, this is my this is my last question. At least um, you mentioned there, are, so many of his sculptures were given as gifts. Mm -hmm. um, so me so much of his work is public. Was he also selling art privately? Was or was um, his income mostly from teaching? Um, I would not. Yeah, his at the beginning his income was teaching. Absolutely. Well, um, he you know started out completely penniless. Um, he had to do odd jobs, essentially, a grocery delivery boy. Um, he tried his hand at, you know, working some of the garment factories. Apparently he was 
not good at that <laughs> and was dismissed very quickly. Um, and so he did quite a lot of odd jobs in order to sort of make his way. Um, at the beginning of his career, uh, teaching was a main source of income, um, but over time he started to sell works and then that, you know, sustained him. Um, he also did sometimes sell works in his collection. Uh, mm -hmm. So for example, I, I didn't mention this in the, in the talk, but it's quite an interesting story, um, which is uh, he originally bought a piece called Coney Island, or also known as the Madonna of Coney Island by Joseph Stella at a framer's shop. And he paid $175 for it because he recognized it was an incredible piece. Wow. And it was hung up in uh, their home on 105th Street for many, many years. Um, and the Met showed an interest in it that they wanted to collect it, you know, and purchase it from him. Uh, he was not reticent about that proposal um, until 1962 when the possibility of purchasing the building on LaGuardia Place came into play. Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, he let that painting go. He sold it to the Met uh, through an intermediary, um, Bella Fischko Forum Gallery. And that piece can now be seen. Um, it's almost always up all the time at the Met. If you go into the uh, uh, galleries there, you'll see it on display. Uh, it's this big round Tondo painting. It's absolutely beautiful. I always make a point of visiting it. Um, so he was, he was smart. <laughs> I would say he was, he was buying works. He was buying real estate. Um, you know, he, he was, he was diversifying where, where his money was coming from. Um, and I, did, I noticed that Jeff had a follow-up statement, um, in the chat saying that, um, that Gross didn't have to go that far to see African arts. You know, he went to the Met, which is absolutely true. I didn't mention this before, but Gross absolutely loved going to the Met every week. Um, it was like on his calendar, like every Friday he went, um, he would go and just spend time in different galleries. Um, so he was very knowledgeable about art history. I love that as like a Shabbat tradition. Yes. <laughs> so lovely. <laughs> so great. Um, thank you so, so much for this. And um, tell us, pardon me, tell us again how we can find out more about the Gross Foundation. And um, if you, you had, you said um, the fall. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So our website is um, www.rcgrossfoundation.org. And maybe Ariel, you can put that in your um, information. Um, we do update that with all of our activities. Um, I expect that all of our uh, online programming will continue to be online for the foreseeable future. At least we're planning it to the end of the year to be um, virtual. Uh, however, we are hoping to reintroduce um, tours in the fall. So we're working on our plans now. Um, it'll be very sort of limited in scope. You'll have a very small group with you, but that only kind of amplifies um, the feeling as if you're visiting the grosses themselves. So great. And um, also I'm going to include in our email um, the link to the video of the event that we did about the restoration of the um, of the artists, you know, the um, the studio part of the of the building, which is just so so beautiful, and I loved I loved learning about that. So, everyone who's here, um, feel free feel free to check that out and learn more. I will include that. And thank you, thank you so so much for spending the evening with us. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Very good. For everyone who came, I really appreciate it, and I, I do hope that I will get to meet you in the future if I haven't already. <laughs> yes. Yes, hopefully, hopefully we'll get to we'll get to bring some folks in for sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Take good care. Good night, everyone.